Good evening and welcome to tonight's Men's Health webinar. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Elizabeth Phillips and Dr. Andrew Winsberger of Centric Care Urology. They'll cover the life after prostate cancer, uh, recovery is a journey presentation, which goes over common side effects of prostate cancer treatment, including male incontinence and erectile dysfunction. Now, you have the opportunity to ask questions anytime during the presentation. Just ask that you tap the screen of your mobile device or move your mouse on your laptop or desktop. A toolbar will pop up. Find the tool that says chat. Click on that, type your question in, hit submit, and we will answer those questions at the conclusion of the webinar. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Andrew Winsberger, and Dr. Elizabeth Phillips. Hi, thank you for joining us all tonight. Um, just another sort of note, um, there is going to be a muting of, of all of the participants, um, and there also will not be any names associated with the participants, so um, you, you will be anonymous. I am Dr. Elizabeth Phillips, as Mike has said. Uh, I am a certifi board certified urologist working in Sartell, Minnesota at Centric Hair Urology. Um, I also do outreach at Little Falls. Um, my specialties include erectile dysfunction, Peyronie's disease, ejaculatory dysfunction, male infertility, and I'm also very active in LGBTQ healthcare. I went to medical school and undergrad at University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities. I did my residency at Boston University Medical Center and then stayed on for a fellowship in sexual medicine and prosthetics. So this is a topic that's very near and dear to me. And hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Dr. Andrew Winsberger, and uh, I'm a urologist with Centricare Urology as well. Uh, practice primarily based out of the Sartell Clinic, and then also I do outreach at the Monticello um, Specialty Clinic as well. Um, similar to Dr. Phillips, you know, my education took me from University of Minnesota to my residency at the University of Kansas, and then afterwards I did a fellowship in reconstructive urology uh, at the University of Colorado, um, which included a large focus on uh, urinary continence and, uh, you know, other facets of reconstruction board certified neurology uh, with specific focus in, you know, kind of all facets of reconstruction, including male and female reconstruction, uh, but particular interests in incontinence, uh, neurogenic bladder, pelvic organ prolapse, uh, urethral stricture disease, and treatment of urinary fistulas. So looking at, you know, kind of a broad overview, um, just some general statistics about prostate cancer, uh, you know, prostate cancer is the most common non-skin cancer in America, most solid organ, most common solid organ tumor affecting uh, one in nine men. And today there are nearly three million men in the United States who count themselves as prostate cancer survivors. Uh, unfortunately, with prostate cancer treatment, as many of you know, there can be some common side effects uh, that go along with, you know, the various treatment options, which can include issues relating to urinary control as well as uh, uh, erectile dysfunction following treatment. So tonight, we kind of wanted to, to review some of the treatment options that we have available for addressing that, that cancer survivorship aspect that's so important after you know, the primary disease is addressed. So take me to my part of the presentation, uh, focusing primarily on incontinence. Uh, so restoring your continence following, following treatment. So what to expect uh, with bladder leakage after prostate cancer treatment, your bladder may leak, you know, anywhere from a few drops of urine uh, to uncontrolled streams. And part of that depends on various factors, you know, anywhere from, uh, you know, factors leading up to the surgery. Uh, often men, you know, with baseline BPH tend to have worse outcomes, you know, following their prostate cancer surgeries. Uh, add in additional factors like complicated, you know, cancers, cancers that were more advanced, or the need for additional adjuvant treatments such as radiation therapy. <clears throat> Generally, most men are pretty successful in terms of getting their continence back. 
usually the expectations are set that, you know, say after prostatectomy, we anticipate that everybody's going to leak. And part of that is just that as men, we're kind of used to having this baseline control that comes from the prostate. You know, the, the prostate kind of provides a passive resistance mechanism. It's always there. It's always providing a little bit of resistance. So we don't really have to think about our control too much. Um, but as many of you know, you know, after the prostate's removed, our continence mechanism switches to the female continence mechanism, which is the external sphincter, basically what you're flexing when you do those Kegel muscles. Before that, you probably didn't have too much cog, you know, uh, too much uh, knowledge of your Kegel muscles unless somebody tried to open the bathroom door on you as you were trying to go and you had to shut things off, right? But then after the prostate's removed, you have to learn how to use that muscle and you have to strengthen that muscle in order to get your control back. So typically what I would counsel men is it's going to take time, you know, after your catheter comes out, after your initial prostate cancer surgery, you have to keep working on that control, working on that muscle. And it's just like going to the gym and strengthening any other muscle. You know, you have to put the time in, but eventually you can, you know, say, get a bigger, stronger bicep after you do a lot of bicep curls. Generally at nine months, 75% uh, of guys up to the point where they're using a safety pad a day or generally are continent. So most patients do regain that bladder control within a year. Um, it's estimated that at two years out, about 2% of men would have bothersome enough incontinence to the point where they'd be seeking, you know, additional treatment options. So persistent stress incontinence is something that certainly can, can affect, you know, daily quality of life and quality of life going forward. And generally that's something that, you know, guys are interested in focusing on once they feel that the initial cancer itself is under good control. Studies have shown that at one year following a robotic prostatectomy, which would be the most common surgical treatment option for prostate cancer management, approximately one in 10 men still had persistent stress incontinence. And again, part of that is, is variable on the amount of bother. Some guys, you know, have a little bit of leakage and aren't terribly bothered by it. Some guys have a little bit of leakage that affects, say, their golf game or their ability to play pickleball, and that social control is really bothersome to them. So if you are bothered by bladder leakage, you certainly have options for treatment. Generally, for mild bladder leakage, you know, that can involve some of our, our methods more for managing the leakage itself as opposed to actually fixing the problem. Um, and so often, that's going to involve the use of absorbent pads. Um, guys tend to have a love-hate relationship with pads, um, you know, certainly something that's helpful from a social perspective, but also kind of a distressor. It always had to be worrying about that and worrying about being wet and, and having to change them. Um, sometimes that control can be bad enough to the point where you're having to use adult diapers as well. There are catheter collection devices such as Texas catheters or condom catheters, which basically <clears throat> collect the urine, which is then uh, collected into a drainage bag, which can be uh, emptied at a later, later time. There are options for penile occlusive devices like an external penile clamp, such as the Cunningham clamp. Uh, you can see pictured at the bottom there, which is essentially like a clothespin. You know, it's an, ex uh, an external clothespin that's placed over the penis that occludes the urethra. And then generally you can unclamp that, you know, say after you're done with your activity and be able to avoid. So that's, that's kind of providing that, that resistance. And then certainly, uh, you know, doing Kegel exercises on your own is a, a big, important part of the recovery, but that can also include referral to a pelvic floor physical therapist. And the difference there is, you know, doing Kegel exercises on your own is like going to the gym and goofing around on the equipment. You know, generally you're going to have some gains, um, you know, but it's, it's incumbent upon you to do that. Whereas working with a pelvic floor physical therapist is like going to the gym and getting a personal trainer. You know, it's somebody that's outlining a plan for you, keeping you accountable to meeting your goals, but also making sure that you're doing the exercises correctly. So for those men who aren't able to get their, their control back to the point where they want or who want to seek additional treatment options, um, we do have you know, several treatment options available. Uh, for moderate bladder leakage, injections or bulking agents are an option, though I would generally uh, say for a lot of guys, the, the benefit one might get from a bulking agent isn't particularly worth going through that. Um, historically, that hasn't been something that's been associated with a large amount of success because of the mechanism of how that incontinence works. Um, you know, the area where the bladder 
is sewn back to the uh, back to the urethra where the prostate once was is a fair amount of scar tissue and for a bulking agent to really have success you need to kind of have fresh tissue that is going to to adequately expand and the experience has been that, that the bulking agents just don't really have a good hold in that area post-operatively. So that then kind of leads us to some of the other treatment options, um, such as the male sling. And uh, one of the options is the Advance male sling, uh, uh, Advance XP made by Boston Scientific. What this does is it's a sling that's intended to support the urethra, and it basically bolsters the effect of that external sphincter. It kind of increases the, the working distance of the external sphincter itself, and it, and it kind of helps to reinforce your ability to have that continence based on the muscular control. Um, and basically, you know, the thought on this is uh, going to be something that works, you know, to help minimize that risk of the stress incontinence during physical exertion, straining, coughing, sneezing, laughing, et cetera. Uh, procedures done, you know, generally as a, a brief outpatient procedure or associated with an overnight stay that's done through a small incision made behind the scrotum uh, in that flat part of the body between the scrotum and the rectum. And the sling basically helps to then, you know, push the urethra back into a better, more supported position that's tensioned around the pubic bone, as you can see here in the picture. And so it's tensioned with two little incisions that are made in the thigh. Generally, as far as recovery, guys are able to get back to their activity fairly soon afterwards. The things I would generally uh, caution guys against would be we don't want you doing any super uh, heavy straining, um, strenuous activity for probably four to six weeks after the surgery to make sure that the sling sets in place to where we want it. That also includes doing deep knee bends because we don't want that tensioning to be upset um, You know, when you're, you're kind of flexing that area where the sling is tensioned around. Uh, but walking, going up and down stairs, you know, that activity uh, is generally accepted. Generally, there's also not a need for having a uh, prolonged duration of catheterization. Usually, I would just leave a catheter in overnight with this procedure. I know everybody who's ever been through prostate cancer treatment hates the idea of having a catheter ever again. So this is a nice option um, that you don't typically have to worry about that with. And then the nice thing is the results are immediate. You kind of know right away how it's working aside from, you know, those times when you're really getting into the vigorous exercise. Um, and then those results also tend to be durable. Um, so it's, it's something that can work well. And if it is working well, it tends to be a long-term solution. The other nice thing with this is it's a passive resistance mechanism. So you don't have to do anything different in terms of going to the bathroom. It's kind of like how it was when the prostate was there. It's there providing that passive resistance when you feel the need to go to the bathroom, you just go. And then when you're done, you're done. You don't have to do anything else. Uh, so it's kind of the more natural option in terms of restoring continence after surgical therapy. For patients with more severe forms of incontinence, and that's probably the, the nuance between the two is there, there is some uh, specification as to who's a good candidate for each. And I can talk about that a little bit after we go over the artificial sphincter. Uh, but the artificial sphincter would be what we consider the, the gold standard for continence. And this is a device that's uh, had an important part in urologic treatment for you know, several decades. What this is, is a three component device consisting of a cuff that goes around the urethra. Uh, there's then the pressure regulating balloon, which sits in the, the space of the body adjacent to the bladder, what's called the, the space of retius, And then the control pump, which is placed down in the scrotum. And basically this is intended to mimic the function of a healthy sphincter, but also to a degree, it kind of mimics the function of that external penile clamp. So at rest, that cuff is closed around the urethra and that's holding pressure against the urethra so that when you exert, you know, you cough, you bear down, there's that, that resistance. So leak, you know, leakage can't make it past the cuff. When it's time for you to empty the bladder and you still have a normal sensation of going to the bathroom, when it's time for you to empty the bladder, uh, you cycle the cuff um, by controlling that pump down in the scrotum. It's a little button that you, you press and that cycles the cuff, opens it up, up, allows you to pass your urine. And then the cuff has a hydraulic mechanism that basically over the course of about 90 to 120 seconds closes itself back down. So what this looks like in practice is you have the sensation that you need to go to the restroom you go, you cycle your pump, the cuff opens up, 
you void normally. And then after that 90 to 120 seconds, the cup is closed and you're back to your activity. And so this is something that, again, can, can restore continence for men. The biggest difference between this and the, the um, sling would be, you know, this is providing both that passive resistance, but it's also an active continence mechanism, meaning you could certainly try, you know, to void past the cuff. I wouldn't recommend that because it's not going to be particularly comfortable because you're, you're basically voiding against a closed urethra. Um, so for men to go to the bathroom, you know, to relieve themselves, they're going to have to cycle the device, um, you know, to, to allow them to relieve themselves. Uh, whereas with the, the sling, you know, it's that passive resistance mechanism. So there's no manipulation of the device or anything like that. So the big difference between the two would be, you know, slings tend to be a better option for guys with more moderate forms of leakage and artificial sphincters tend to be devices that are better suited for men with more severe forms of leakage. And usually the different, uh, differentiation for me would be five pads a day. You know, if you're five pads a day or less, typically you're going to be a reasonable sling candidate for patients that are more incontinent, you know, talking about several diapers a day, you know, I'd, I'd probably steer them towards the artificial urinary sphincter. Now the sphincter is a mechanical device. And so there can be some nuance too, in terms of the potential wear and tear, just like anything, you know, you can't expect your car to run forever. You can't expect your sphincter to work forever either. Um, typically these are devices that may require some revision down the road, but those revision surgeries are fairly straightforward. Uh, these are done in the operating room. Uh, to place a sphincter usually takes similar, you know, about 90 minutes to do, uh, 60 to 90 minutes, depending. And then the recovery with that would involve uh, stay in the hospital. And then the device isn't actually activated or turned on for a six week uh, period of time to allow things to heal. Uh, so the recovery is a little bit more involved, I'd say, but, you know, certainly uh, the results are worth it for guys who are, who are in need of that. So in order to assess your condition, um, you know, there are several things you can use as far as home trackers, uh, bladder leakage quizzes. You know, it's often helpful for, for your provider to know, you know, when is the incontinence occurring, differentiating between the different types of incontinence that occur. Is it urgency? Is it stress incontinence? You know, keeping a log of how many pads a day you're using can also be helpful to differentiate which options are the best for you. Um, so having some baseline knowledge of that is helpful. Uh, a lot of that safety information is available at fixincontinence.com, you know, regarding the various devices. And you can also find copies of these quizzes as well as more information at that same website. Um, so just an important thing to think about, you know, would be how would you rate your incontinence? And, and certainly there's some, some subjectivity to that um, in terms of its impact, you know, in your personal life, uh, your social life, those sorts of things. Um, but certainly some nuance that goes into the decision-making uh, as to which option might be a good one for you. All right, thanks, Dr. Winsberger. <clears throat> so I'm up. Uh, we're gonna be talking about restoring your sexual health and specifically uh, erections. There we go. Okay, so prostate cancer treatment may affect the nerves that control erection. So what I tell my patients, because I do diagnose prostate cancer is, you know, it really, depending on the, the treatment option that you choose, your erections will likely be affected. Um, you, it's very, very unlikely for your erections to remain the same after treatment. So, at the very least, if you had perfect erections beforehand, I do see a lot of men needing something like Viagra or Cialis after. Um, it, but it may take a while to, to know how well your erection function is gonna come back. So typically speaking, we'll kind of watch that. We can do things like what I call penile rehabilitation, um, things like that um, for about two years before we talk about surgical treatments often, although there is some, um, you know, some wiggle room there. Um, I do like to encourage penile rehab after prostatectomy surgery. So after surgical treatment of um, prostate cancer, 
And that, you know, again, sort of depends on how much effort a patient wants to put in, usually starting with oral medications, but we can progress to some of the other options that we'll talk about uh, tonight. But if that ability to have erections doesn't recover and particularly doesn't recover after a period of several months or a couple years, there are certainly other options um, that we'd like you to be aware of. So as I mentioned, there are oral medications. A lot of men actually come into, you know, their diagnosis of prostate cancer and come into treatment uh, already on these oral medications and they may or may not be working well for you. Um, so, but I do, you know, often recommend or um, encourage patients to try oral medications afterwards. Uh, sometimes we'll just give a low dose, a daily dose of medication, kind of to try to encourage blood flow to the pelvic floor, not just the penis, but the pelvic floor. Um, the thought being that that may help those tissues heal better um, and not um, become scarred down or, you know, lose some of their function. Um, but, you know, again, often, especially early on after prostate cancer surgery or even radiation, um, those treatments may not be very effective. If people aren't really, really motivated to have erections for sex at that point, I think that's fine. Um, but if you are, then, you know, moving on to some other options is, is also good. Um, vacuum pumps. I love vacuum pumps for penile rehabilitation as well not even just to have an erection for sex, um, but for, again, stretching that tissue, getting good blood flow into the, the penis, and trying to maintain as much um, girth and length to the penis as you can. So after prostate cancer surgery, for example, we know that patients lose penile length. We know you're going to lose length. Um, but using that vacuum device can help to maintain length. And, you know, in some cases, there have been studies showing that you may actually improve length to some degree um, with regular use of a vacuum pump. Uh, typically, these pumps are used with um, this constriction band or ring that you can see at the base of the penis there to hold the blood in. But when I'm having patients use this for penile rehabilitation, I usually just have you keep the suction on and the vacuum on. For a period of time without the band. So we're still getting good oxygenated blood and not kind of, you know, pinching it off like a tourniquet. Um, but that ring at the base is necessary if you're going to use the vacuum for, uh, for sex. So that's what basically keeps that blood in. So you can take the pump off and then have intercourse. Um, other options, you can see the other small pictures there, penile injections. That's a very common one um, that patients will sort of turn to after pills. Um, that can be very, very effective for some patients. So particularly if you have um, just mostly nerve injury or nerve damage following your prostatectomy, um, the injections can actually be quite effective. I will say though that the majority of patients don't just have nerve injury, they also have vascular injury as well. So penile injections may still work for you, um, but you know, again, that's not a guarantee. I'm also gonna mention here the, the, the concept of a nerve sparing prostatectomy. Um, so that's typically done like with a robotic prostatectomy, the entire prostate is going to be removed. Um, but based on what your cancer is acting like or looking like before surgery, your surgeon may or may not uh, agree to, you know, trying to what we call spare the nerves. Um, meaning they're pushing the nerves off that run along the sides of the prostate. Sometimes there's every intention to do that, and it just at the time of surgery doesn't work well. Um, and sometimes we purposefully don't spare those nerves or we leave them on the prostate because we're concerned about the aggressive nature of the prostate, and we want to be sure we get all the prostate cancer out. Now, just because you've had a nerve sparing prostatectomy does not necessarily mean that everything is going to work perfectly after surgery. Um, so again, you know, I often have patients coming in saying, well, they said they spared the nerves. So, you know, why is this happening? Um, 
you know, again, there is trauma that's happening in that area. It's actually a big surgery, despite the very small incisions that you see on your belly. So just because you've had a nerve sparing um, prostatectomy doesn't necessarily mean that everything's going to work ship shape right after. So, okay, so moving on, urethral suppositories, that's actually something I don't even believe is on the market anymore, but what we do have are urethral gels that basically do the same thing. Um, they're put into the urethra, the tube that you pee through, um, and basically, you know, try to encourage blood flow to the penis locally. Typically, in my experience, if the pills don't work for you, the urethral suppositories are not going to work well either. Um, and then again, we've got the penile implant. Now the penile implant, you can see at the bottom of the screen there, um, that is surgically placed. So similar to a lot of the, the things that Dr. Winsberger was uh, talking about tonight, uh, this is a surgery. So the, this surgery, and I think um, is often done as an outpatient. I'm gonna move on here. Um, so there are a few different types of penile implants, and the one that we sort of consider to be the gold standard is referred to as a three-piece inflatable penile prosthesis. There are actually four pieces because there are two um, cylinders or inflatable balloons in the penis in the areas where your erectile chambers are. So the, the parts of the penis that get hard when you get a normal erection are replaced with these balloons. And then there is a reservoir similar to the sphincter that Dr. Winsberger talked about, typically sitting alongside that bladder, sometimes in a different location. And then a pump that controls everything there in the scrotum. Um, this is something that will give you an erection good enough for sex, lasts as long as you want it to, and goes away when you don't want it there. So, you know, dissimilar to some of the other options we talked about, there really doesn't have to be a lot of planning as far as when you're going to take a pill or equipment that needs to be brought along or, or remembered or in a you know good location to make things a little bit more spon uh, spontaneous. That prosthetic is sort of ready to go whenever. It is all on the inside of the body, so you can't see anything on the outside of the body. Um, and, you know, again, a, a, a good long-term option, particularly if a lot of those other options have been tried and are not, um, not working. So, um, one of the things that we'll have you do, and in particular, and as you come in for prostate cancer rechecks, often usually your surgeon or, or the provider will ask about erections as well as um, about incontinence to kind of get a gauge of how you're doing with that and how bothered you are by it. Because obviously there are some patients who have erectile dysfunction and it's not a bother because sex really isn't a big part of their uh, life or a big part of their relationship, which is totally fine. Um, there is more information if you're interested in looking at this or, or taking your own self-assessment at edcure.org, um, or certainly you can obviously come and, and make an appointment with one of us to discuss this or ask your surgeon. So um, I am going to jump down to the last question here, and then I'm going to have Dr. Winsberger uh, go and address the top one. But uh, a question that I often get is, are penile implants covered by insurance? And the answer is, uh, particularly in Minnesota, often yes. There is very good coverage for this. It's also covered by Medicare uh, for patients who have secondary insurance. Usually that means that Medicare picks up whatever, and then your uh, secondary insurance picks up the rest. So interestingly, even though insurance typically doesn't cover the pills or even the vacuum or some of those other options I mentioned, um, surgery is often uh, covered, um, and that's for the treatment of erections as well as incontinence. Um, and then another thing I wanted to mention, because I'm not sure that it comes up in the slides, I don't think so, is that um, we can treat these two things together. So um, if you're having issues with leakage and with erectile dysfunction, and if it's found that, you know, maybe a penile prosthesis is a good option for you, and so is a sling, or so is uh, a sphincter, um, they 
you don't have to choose one or the other. Um, they, you know, they're Dr. Rensberger and I certainly do place them both together at the same time on the same patient. So um, that's also an option. Um, and I talked a little bit about why all men don't recover um, erectile function, but you know, again, I mentioned sometimes it's a nerve injury, but a lot of times there are other risk factors, sort of what what I are considered to be vascular risk factors, things like um, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, high cholesterol, smoking, being overweight, those sorts of things that are going to contribute to this as well. So both incontinence and erectile dysfunction, big issues after um, prostate cancer um, treatment, um, but definitely some options for recovery. And just speaking to that that top question, you know, how long does it take to achieve bladder control? Um, again, generally, a, a lot of your patients are going to be better by the nine to twelve month mark after prostatectomy. It may not be perfect, um, but generally, most you know anti incontinent surgeries. I would usually try to have guys wait until year two, you know, following surgery, just to make sure that they're able to get that full control uh, on their own. You can kind of see the writing on the wall sometimes if a guy is plateaued at like, you know, 14 to 18 months and just isn't making any, you know, significant headway. And every once in a while, you also see the patient that is just, you know, debilitated by their incontinence at a year. Um, and there's no sense in making somebody suffer if you have a good treatment option. Um, and that doesn't mean that you can't still continue to work on exercises on your, on your own. Um, which is important to note, you know, with, with something like the sling, you know, the sling is working to bolster the effect of the external sphincter. So you still do need to be cognizant of your, of your pelvic floor. Um, and just like any other muscle, if you stop going to the gym, you're going to lose some of those gains. So keeping up with, uh, with doing your exercises regularly is important. The implants for stress incontinence uh, are covered by insurance. You know, generally the anti-incontinent surgery is an important part of the cancer survivorship, but incontinence itself as a medical diagnosis, even though you're electing to treat it, um, is still covered as a medical diagnosis. So typically we don't run into too much problem um, from an insurance standpoint as far as coverage. And then, you know, the factors like we talked about as far as uh, inability to achieve bladder control, um, as Dr. Phillips mentioned, a lot of the same factors such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, you know, all of those things that kind of decrease your health as a whole can also lead to worse outcomes, um, you know, with regaining that continence. But some of the specific factors um, that can affect it would be, you know, pre-standing or, or pre-existing prostate symptoms, you know, those obstructive symptoms like, uh, you know, difficulty with urination, urgency of urination, et cetera. Guys with very large prostates at the time of prostatectomy can make it harder for you to get control back. And then radiation has part of the treatment um, algorithm for managing the cancer can also significantly impact uh, your control. Now, if you don't mind uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce one of these uh, real people who's gone through this journey. Um, we have the privilege of having Cliff Pollock here, who's gonna talk about his journey with prostate cancer um, and treatment afterward. Yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Mike said, I am a prostate cancer survivor. Uh, when I was 58, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, went to the doc and they did a biopsy. And only one little spot of all the areas they, 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 they <clears throat> excuse me, they took was cancerous. And my decision was to have the prostate removed before the cancer got any bigger and spread anywhere. So I had the cancer removed and did lose some control of urination, but that came back after a while. Uh, after about a year, I started having erection problems and finally decided, okay, went back to my regular physician and they put me on Viagra. The pills never worked for me. I kept thinking I was taking them wrong, but I was taking them correctly. So they switched me from Viagra to Cialis to Levitra. Uh, none of the pills worked. They all gave me terrible, terrible headaches. 
to the point where I'd have to go into bed and I couldn't lift my head up off the pillow. So after about six months of that, I went back to my doc and I said, look, this is not working. He suggested the external vacuum device. And the external vacuum device did work. Uh, the only thing about it that I is negative, there's a couple of things. Number one, when you use it, your penis kind of turns blue. It has a blue tinge to it, which <laughs> I'm not sure how good that looks to your partner. Um, the other thing is that I found is taking off the band and coming up the shaft is fine. And coming over the head always, always hurt. So after six months, I gave that up. And then I went back to my doctor. He said, need to see the urologist. So I went to see a prosthetic urologist and he gave me some ideas about just like you had tonight. And my wife and I talked about it and decided that we would go with the inflatable penile prosthetic. I will say one thing. Uh, ED is not just a male issue. It's a couple's issue because it's something that uh, affects both of you. And my suggestion is if you have a partner that you take them with you when you go to see the doctor so they have an understanding of what's going on. I can't tell you how many of my friends who do suffer from ED, their wives tell my wife, oh, he's having an affair on the outside. He doesn't find me attractive anymore, which is the farthest from the truth. So if they know what's really going on, it's a lot easier to deal with. Well, when I was 60, I got the penile implant. I will tell you, <laughs> brought back a sense of intimacy that we had lost over two years. And it was incredible to be able to have sex again and feel like a real man and have my full manhood back. Uh, the recovery time for me was only two weeks. I went back to work after two weeks. I went back to the gym. I would shower with the guys after we worked out. They had absolutely no idea I had anything inside me. Uh, the thing that did work for me was it lasted 14 years my first one. So I had 14 years of tremendous, tremendous orgasms and ability to have sex with my wife. And it, it was incredible. At the end of 14 years, when it started to malfunction, I went back to my prosthetic urologist and had another one put in, had a second one, had a revision done. Uh, the, the results of that was that the time to recover was much shorter than the first time. And now that I'm 77, I've had it for three years. And hopefully it'll last another 11 years. So that's it. Yeah, I'm married 55 years, so it's got to go. It's got to be good. Uh, a couple of the things that people ask me is, when you go to the airport, does it ring when you go through the metal detector like your knees do? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Uh, I do have prosthetic knees, so they go off and then they take you into the corner. And I don't know if you've ever had this, but they take this wand and they go around your body and they go up your thighs and by your crotch. Nothing happens and they say goodbye and you just go on the plane. Another thing that they asked me is, how do you feel about, you know, pumping it up as far as did you start to do it before you started to be, have some, you know, intercourse and foreplay or what? Well, the answer is you can, you can, <clears throat> excuse me, you can inflate it anytime you want. The thing that's nice about it is it's one of those things that reminds me of the Energizer Bunny. You don't have this problem of, uh, four, you know, if you, if you have an erection that lasts more than, I think, four hours, 
you need to go to the hospital to get it taken care of because you could have some major problems. Well, with the in implant, you can leave it up if you wanted to, four hours, four days, 40 days, it's not gonna hurt. Uh, you may not wanna walk around that way, but that's the way it is. Um, your orgasms are basically like they were prior to having any problems. As a matter of fact, some men, including myself, have found that the head of the penis becomes a lot more sensitive. And it seems to me that my orgasms were a little more effective for me. They were just better than they were before. Uh, I will give you just one little hint that you, you do decide to get an implant, uh, you take with you. Anybody can blow the implant up. So if you're not feeling good, and you want your wife or partner to blow it up, that's fine. I will tell you, my wife has done my implant four times. It is when she has my scrotum in her hand and she's ready to squeeze. And she says, hey, Cliff, you know that bathroom I want redone? It cost me two bathrooms in a kitchen, but it's well worth it. <laughs> that's all I have to say about it. It will restore your manhood. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing to have. And I, I wish I knew who invented it, because I'd send him a letter saying thank you. So I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Thank you, Cliff. Now, uh, we've got some pre-submitted questions. Uh, if you don't mind, we'll dive into those. So first question is uh, related to orgasm. Um, so person asked uh, after the penile implant um, and I guess I think I'm assuming they have prostate cancer uh, will I be able to orgasm like I did before and I think maybe they're talking about ejaculate yeah so as crit as um Cliff mentioned the orgasm sensation is typically the same but after prostate cancer surgery so a prostatectomy they have what's called a dry orgasm, meaning no ejaculate, no fluid that comes out. The caveat to that is sometimes it's not particularly dry because there may be some leakage. There might be some urine that comes out. Um, still no ejaculate or semen that's coming out. But, you know, again, sometimes, you know, particularly if you have a little bit of issues with leakage or a lot of issues with leakage, there might be some urine that comes out. So the orgasm itself, typically the same, that shouldn't change the ejaculate or the fluid coming out that changes no semen anymore after your prostate is gone thank you there's a question related to the duration uh, with the artificial urinary sphincter how long it stays open yeah generally i would tell guys um you know, once you cycle it, um, and to cycle, it's going to take anywhere from one to three, you know, pumps of the device, uh, generally 90 seconds to, you know, two minutes, 120 seconds, um, would be the, the time frame. Most often that's going to be enough time for guys to finish up what they need to do. Uh, I do have some guys that, you know, for, for whatever reason, they like to spend a little bit of time <laughs> to make sure that they're all the way emptied. They might, you know, decide that they want to cycle again before they leave the restroom. But, um, you know, it's not like you're going to be spending a, a significant amount of time in there, uh, two minutes. Thank you. Now, there's a question about um, the recovery of implant surgeries. So if somebody has a physical job, is that something where they need to miss work? I'll take it for the penile implant. Um, I do, depending on the person's job and what they can do, I do typically like patients to be out of work for one or two weeks. Typically, then you can kind of get back to it. If you are someone with a really active job, um, the concern for me is a lot of swelling in the scrotum and a lot of swelling you know, potentially leading to infection, infection around the, um, the prosthetic. Um, I don't have patients cycle it until six weeks, but I see patients at two weeks. And then again, at six weeks, when we learn how to, when they learn how to use it. Um, but 
typically speaking, a week to two weeks off, depending on your job. Thank you. And I would I would echo that too. I mean, I think uh, with with the two urinary devices, the biggest thing um, aside from physicality is straddle activity. Um, and what I mean by that would be, you know, the, the last thing you're going to want to do within a week of <laughs> surgery like that is go for a bike ride. Um, so you need to give the perineum, um, again, that, that flat part of the body between the scrotum and the rectum, you need to give that some time to heal. Uh, so generally straddle activity, you know, I, I probably wouldn't clear you to do that until you're out, um, at the six week mark when we've activated the device, we know that you're feeling good. Um, physicality wise, you know, I may be a little bit more conservative. I, I would say, you know, if you're feeling good at two weeks and you can kind of ease into things fine, I would guess most guys are probably more on the order of taking three to four weeks before they're getting back to something physical because, you know, not only is it um, straining and, and the risk of swelling and that sort of thing, but you don't really want stuff coming into contact. Like you don't want to get tapped down there and you don't want to get, um, you know, accidentally struck uh, not that it's going to like break anything or cause anything to explode, but it just sets you back in the recovery. And by the time we, I see guys at six weeks, they're, they're ready to go, you know, with the artificial sphincter, they, they want to use it. They've been waiting. Um, you know, so it, they're, they really want to make sure that things go right with that recovery. Thank you. Now, this gentleman asked, said I had a radical prostatectomy 14 years ago. I've been suffering with incontinence and ED since. Is it too late to get treatment? No, not at all. <laughs> Come see us. <laughs> yeah, no, there's there's a good fix. Uh, there's really no expiration date on when you can get, you know, when you can get things addressed. Um, and there's no need to, you know, th there, there are good fixes. Um, you know, there's certainly not a need to suffer. And then a question about age. So um, for older patients, they don't disclose how old they are, but they're wondering if um, at a certain point, um, if they're too old to have their erectile dysfunction treated. Not by me. <laughs> um, I don't discriminate based on age. Um, I tell patients the oldest patient I've ever done a removal and replacement, as Cliff mentioned, of a prosthetic was in his early 90s, and he was still quite active and so um, and, uh, and otherwise quite healthy. And so um, that, that was done. But um, I would say the majority of patients are probably in their 50s and 60s, but I've certainly, it's not uncommon for me to treat patients in their 70s and 80s. Thank you. So there's hope. Gen generally, you know, for me to thinking about, you know, not only your primary evaluation of a patient, but also your guy who, you know, is in need of a, a revision or, you know, has a device that isn't functioning like it once did. I've revised artificial sphincters, you know, for men in their nineties who still, um, you know, had, had good cognition and good dexterity and could manipulate the device. And I think with the question about ED, I mean, as long as your heart is healthy enough for sex, have that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the only um, things that I will kind of think twice about or, or just kind of flat out say no to, to at least the three-piece penile prosthesis would be uncontrolled diabetes. Um, that, you know, I might, we might talk about one of the other options for a penile prosthesis, but uncontrolled diabetes is a, is a big one for me. And I'd say one of the only um, sort of absolute contraindications in my practice. Okay. We've got a question about how, how do you manage a person who has got both ED and incontinence? Do you want to take that, Dr. Winsberg? Uh, that'd be the full meal deal. Uh, so like Dr. Phillips alluded to, you know, certainly there are instances where guys uh, are seeing us for both issues. And, and those are, uh, we call it the AMS 1500, you know, <laughs> where we put in the AMS 800 uh, artificial sphincter plus the AMS 700, you know, uh, penile prosthesis, uh, 700 plus 800 is 1500. So, but, you know, certainly there, there is opportunity uh, to treat both. Um, and it, it's nice. It makes a lot of sense. 
uh, in those instances because, um, you know, it, it just truncates your recovery. Um, you can, you can, you know, do a two for one. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. If we do the two implants, um, you know, as, as you've seen in the pictures, there are reservoirs for each and we'll typically put one on one side and one on the other. It's really not something you have to worry about. Um, but the scrotal pumps as well, we'll usually try to slide one along one side and then one either towards the middle or towards the other side so that they're very easy to keep, you know, know which one is which. And the scrotum's not going to be too crowded and we don't have to remove any testicles to do that. But, um, but yeah, it's absolutely an option. Thank you. Now, as I make a last call for questions here, um, what is the best way to reach you, get a hold of you, um, I guess, find you if patients are interested in having their condition treated or learning more? Well, um, we can throw up our um, contact info. So if you're a, a patient of the urology, central care urology already, you can reach out to your provider, if it's us or someone else, and say that you'd like to get more information about either your leakage or your uh, erectile dysfunction or both. Um, you know, you can also find, if you're not in our area, you can find other providers through the fixincontinence.com or edcure.org um, websites. We do have an active us too um, prostate cancer support group in our area. Um, so that's something that we can give you information on as well. Um, but basically getting a hold of us at Centra Care Urology. Um, the uh, phone number, I believe, will be sent out with the link to this presentation, but it is 320-259-1411. And right, a lot of instances. It's also in the yeah, chat. Okay. A lot of instances you can even contact the clinic and, and just say you're a self-referral, you know, for one of these specific conditions. If you're not, um, you know, an active patient within the, the practice, um, you know, depending upon insurance, uh, you know, that that can often be made directly. Yes, our, our clinic does accept self-referral, so you don't need to have your doctor refer you uh, if you're not already a urology patient. Um, but sometimes insurance do, you know, companies do prefer that referral. So that's kind of an insurance question. So tomorrow, everyone will receive an email with uh, contact information for both of you, uh, links to your respective provider pages. Uh, and we will include the webinar video if someone wants to watch that again. Um, so, so no questions came in. Any final comments from you? I just want to thank everyone for your time. And thank you, Cliff, for your time and Mike for, for um, spearheading this. Um, and we, we hope to hear from you. Yeah, thank you very much for attending, uh, Cliff and, and Mike, uh, for for assisting as well. And I think, I mean, the most important step is, is recognizing that you're, you're, you're ready to seek a solution. You know, there's, there are good options out there. Um, often guys suffer in silence for too long. Um, and so making sure that you're talking to somebody about it, be it your primary care provider or your partner, um, you know, there, there are solutions, uh, but the first step needs to come <laughs> from you. Um, and certainly we can help take the reins after that. Folks, it's Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. You've taken a big step in your treatment journey. Uh, we have the, I, I enjoyed hearing from, and uh, I want to thank Dr. Phillips, Dr. Winsberger, and Cliff. This concludes tonight's event. Please continue your journey um, and take that next step in celebration of Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Good night. Thank you.